Hello. How many arcs of the covenant were made? Is there one, two, three, four? Is there more than one on earth? And is there any in heaven? It seems that Moses first made an ark for the tablets of stone by himself. And a short time afterwards, Moses was instructed to have a craftsman called Bezael make one. So where so were there two different arcs? Did Moses first make a simple one of wood and then later have Bezael make another wooden one wrapped in clean gold? Or did Moses simply give Bezael, I mean Bez, Bezael the ark he made of wood and command him to overlay it in gold? In short, Yes, indeed, there were two separate arcs. The Ark of the Covenant made of a cassia wood and clean gold is first mentioned in the book of Exodus. Its description and construction is first described in Exodus 25 and then again in Exodus 37 when Bezalel was commissioned to make the second ark. So how many more arcs of the covenant were made or exist? Is there really an ark made of flesh? And is there any heavenly one made of pure, clean gold that existed before any of the corruptible earthly ones did? If so, then the total of arcs seems to add up to four. Is this true? Let's turn to scripture and find out. First of all, scripture says Moses made the ark out of acacia wood and chiseled out two more stone tablets like the first ones he broke. And then he went up on the mountain with the two new tablets in his hands. Let's read about this first earthly ark made of wood by Moses in the scriptures itself. We can easily find it in Deuteronomy 10 verses 1 and 2. And at that time Yahuwah said to me, Hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain, and you shall make yourself an ark of wood. Then I write, then I write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up to the mountain with the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets according to the first writing, the ten words, which Yahuwah had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. Then Yahuwah gave them to me, and I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made. And they are there, as Yahuwah commanded me. Seemingly then, a short time afterwards, another design or pattern for a design for the ark of the covenant was given to Moses while he was still on Mount Sinai. In fact, Exodus 25, verses 8, 9, and 40 says that Elohim not only showed Moses the copy or pattern to make the new Ark of the Covenant from, he showed Moses a pattern for the tabernacle itself and all the furniture to be used in the tabernacle. Let's briefly read about this. We can find it in Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9. And they shall make me a set-apart place, and I shall dwell in their midst, according to all that I show you, the pattern of the dwelling place, 
and the pattern of all its furnishings. Make it exactly so. <clears throat> when we stop to consider what must have been shown to Moses on Mount Sinai, we can only come up with several ideas that make any sense. The pattern was either a vision of sorts, or he was shown an actual existing ark somewhere else. If it was the latter, then where did this pattern exist? In Hebrews 8, 5, we get an answer to that question. It tells us that the tabernacle Moses was told to build is copied like something that exists in the heavenly. So it was not patterned after a vision of sorts, but a real existing pattern that was already built in the heaven. Let's read about that. It's in Hebrews 8, 5. Who serve, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly, as Moses was warned when he was about to make the tent. For he said, see that you make all according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly. So he was showed it in the heavens. It's pretty plain. This is fairly clear, folks. It already existed in heaven, and Moses uh, saw it and was given a command to copy or pattern it exactly as he saw it. Since he was commanded to make the Ark of the Covenant exactly like he was shown it in heaven, then it becomes obvious that the plain wooden Ark that Moses made on the earth wasn't acceptable and would have to be thrown out. Just think about it. How could Moses possibly have known the exact dimensions and appearance of the ark or how to copycat its pattern before he ever saw it or was told about the one in heaven? It's plain folks. He couldn't have known. So therefore we know that it was tossed out and a new one was built to take its place. Moreover, Hebrews 9.23 is confirmation that the tabernacle and ark is in fact a copy of something in heaven. Let's read it in Hebrews 9.23. It was necessary, then, that the copies of the heavenly ones should be cleansed with these, but the heavenly ones themselves with better slaughter offerings than these. This is clearly saying that the ones on earth or the copies of the heavenly ones should be cleansed with animal blood and the heavenly ones themselves also but they would be cleansed with the blood of the Mashiach not with animal blood and in Acts 7 4, 44 we read the tent of witness was with our fathers in the wilderness as he appointed instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. When we compare Exodus 25 verses 8 through 16 and 40 to these other verses, we begin to fully understand that the instructions that Yahuwah gave Moses for building the Ark of the Covenant was copied or patterned after an existing one already in the heaven. Seemingly, the building of the Ark of the Covenant was extremely difficult 
and nearly impossible for mere mortal men to build. So the Ruach HaKadosh overshadowed shadowed or entered certain craftsmen which gave them the ability to construct the ark, furniture, and tabernacle. So the Ruach HaKadosh actually gave them the wisdom and the skills to be able to make the Ark of the Covenant, cover, uh, covenant the furniture, and the tabernacle. Couldn't have done it without the Ruach. Ex Exodus 37, 1 through 9 describes the actual building of the Ark of the Covenant. Again, we are told that a man named Bezalel made the Ark aided by the indwelling Ruach. Obviously, the pattern that he followed matches exactly the one given to Moses in Exodus 25. Since in that passage we are told that Yahuwah directed Moses to build the Ark of the Covenant from Akisia wood uh, and then overlay it with clean gold inside and outside and add gold molding all around. It was to have four gold rings and attached to the four feet. The two poles were also to be overlaid with gold. The content inside of the ark is described in Hebrews 9, verses 1 through 4. Let's read about that. Now the first indeed had regulations of worship in the earthly set-apart place. For a tent was prepared, the first part, in which was the lampstand, and the table, and the showbread, which is called the Kodesh place. And after the second veil, the part of the tent which is called most set apart, to which belonged the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that held the, that held the manna, the golden pot that held the manna, and the rod of Aaron that budded, and the tablets of the covenant, the stone tablets of the covenant. That's what was the contents inside of the ark. So then we have learned that the ark of the covenant was copied from an existing one inside the temple or tabernacle that had already existed in heaven. It was copied exactly most likely the pattern of the temple and the ark in heaven was made of clean, pure, solid gold. Since John also tells us that the streets of the city was clean gold, likened to transparent glass. The lid or mercy seat was made of one solid piece of gold with two golden cherubs on it, and it was placed on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Again, Hebrews 9, 4 tells us that inside the Ark of the Covenant were three items. A golden pot with that held some of the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of stone containing the written ten words of the blood covenant, or better known as the Ten Commandments. According to the scriptures, the first set of tablets inscribed by the finger of Elohim were smashed or broken by Moses when he was enraged by the sight of the children of Israel worshiping a golden calf. And the plates for the second tablets were later chiseled out by Moses himself and carried back up the mountain where they were rewritten by the finger of Yahuwah, and then Moses carried them back down the mountain and placed them in the first ark that he had made from a, 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 a acacia wood. Remember in Hebrews 9, 5, when scripture mentions that above the covenant written on stone tablets, the two cherub of esteem were shat shadowing the place of atonement, which is better known as the lid or covering. Yahuwah called it the mercy seat. 
The reason I am repeating this or bringing it back up is because this is vitally important because we don't want to miss the fact that Yahuwah promised to meet them at the mercy seat between the two cherubs once per year. Let's read it. Uh, this is important. This is an important point. We find it in Exodus 25:22. So let's go back to Exodus real quick. Okay. So, uh, and you shall put the lid of atonement on top of the ark. And put into the ark the witness which I give you. And I shall meet with you there. And from above the lid of atonement from between the two cherub which are on the ark of the witness. I shall speak to you all that which I command you concerning the children of Israel. So this is where they actually get to hear Yahuwah talk. Very important. So at this point, someone may be wondering, why is this even important to us in our modern day era? It doesn't even sound like it matters anymore to me. This is because up to now, we have been study studying the Ark of the Covenant and Tabernacle in our reality, meaning in the mind of the flesh. Since we are commanded to worship and walk in the spirit and truth with the Ruach, let's finish this study in the mind of the spirit, shall we? Hold on tight and stick with me. We are about to take this to a whole new level of understanding by taking a look at all this from a different perspective, meaning from or through our spiritual mind. So then, spiritually speaking, Yahusha is the mercy seat for us, meaning for the believers, because it is through Yahusha that Yahuwah meets with us, not just one day of the year, but today and any other day here in our reality upon the earth. Furthermore, we have become his house or permanent dwelling place. In other words, he never leaves home. Scripture cleanly says, or clearly says, he will never leave or forsake us. Since our bodies are his loving temple, not made with hands, our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant. Our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant, and which now holds the ten words of the renewed blood covenant. In other words, they are no longer written on stone tablets, but are inscribed on our inward parts and mind. I'm not sure how deep into the spiritual realm any of you have ventured, or where you are at in your spiritual walk at this particular time, but Yahuwah knows. Anyways, I will speak it or say it nonetheless. Our spirit or inner being is the mercy seat in which the Ruach HaKadosh sits and talks with us. In other words, the old fleshly copies or earthly imitation patterns or copied heavenly imitations by hands have been abolished, annulled, or destroyed. They have been rendered useless and no longer of any value. Because Yahusha and his atonement blood sacrifice is the expectation that has already come. The old covenant has become the renewed covenant, which is a better covenant. It is now a spiritual covenant, not a fleshly or earthly covenant, written on stone tablets and carried or kept in an ark built of wood and minerals with men's hands. The fulfillment of Mashiach, Yahusha's first coming, destroyed all that, including the temple, the tabernacle, rituals, 
including all the furniture and utilities needed to perform the religious rituals. The Ark of the Covenant, the menorah, the showbread table, the table of incense, the veil that separated us from Yahuwah, the Holy of Holies, and the entire old priesthood has been and is annulled. All this earthly copies, all these earthly copies were shadows of Yahuwah's spiritual reality. This is why Yahuwah allowed the temple to be destroyed in 70 AD after his ascension. Matter of fact, Yahuwah didn't want it built in the first place. We can read about his disappointment that the Jews wanted to build him a home in Isaiah 66, verses 1 through 5. Let's read that. Isaiah 66, 1 through 5. Thus said Yahuwah, The Shemayim are my throne and the rest is my footstool. Where is this house that you build for me? And where is this place of my rest? And all these my hand have made, and all these that exist, declares Yahuwah. Yet to such a one I look, on him who is poor and bruised of spirit, and who trembles at my word. Whoever slaughters the bull slays a man, Whoever slaughters the lamb breaks a dog's neck. Whoever brings a grain offering, pig's blood. Whoever burns incense, blesses an idol. Indeed, they have chosen their own ways, and their being delights in their abominations. I shall also choose their punishments and bring their fears on them. Because I called, but no one answered. I spoke, and they did not hear and they did evil before my eyes, and chose what was displeasing to me. Hear the word of Yahuwah, you who tremble at his word, your brothers who hate you, who cast you out of my, my namesake, said, Let Yahuwah be esteemed, so that we see your joy, but they are put to shame. Doesn't sound like he was thr real thrilled about them building him a home built with men's hands. The portion or phase of Yahushua's work that annulled the old priesthood is understood as the one-time permanent blood sacrifice which takes away the sins of the world. Let's turn to Hebrews 9 again verses 20 and 28 and read about that this is the blood of the covenant which Yahuwah commanded you and in the same way he sprinkled with blood both the tent, all the vessels of the service. And according to the Torah, almost all is cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then that the copies of the heavenly ones should be cleansed with these, but the heavenly ones themselves with better slaughter offerings than these. <clears throat> In fact, we can read about Yahuwah's better covenant or spiritual covenant. It is known as the renewed or new covenant. It's in Hebrews 8, Romans 6, 7 and 8, Jeremiah 31, and Ezekiel 36. You know, this is such a vitally important subject we're on. Let's read about it together in Hebrews 8, 6 13, shall we?
But now, <clears throat> but now he has obtained a more excellent service inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was constituted on better promises. For if that first had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, See, the days are coming, says Yahuwah, when I shall conclude with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah a renewed covenant, not according to the covenant, covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them says Yahuwah but this is the good the covenant that I shall make with the house of Israel after those days says Yahuwah given my laws in their mind and I shall write them on their hearts and I shall be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. And they shall by no means teach each one his neighbor, and each one his brother, saying, Know Yahuwah, because they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Because I shall forgive their rebellion, and their sins, and their lawlessness, I shall no longer remember. By saying renewed, he has made the first old. Now what becomes old and growing aged is near disappearing. Wow, huh? So, it should now be fairly clear that the two earthly Ark of the Covenants, both made by hands, has been destroyed and replaced by the real true Ark of the Covenant made by Yahuwah, which is us humans, made of flesh. But in order to satisfy inquiring minds, let's do a slightly extended but quick study on the old Ark of the Covenant. The Ark has a number of seemingly spiritual powers, according to the Hebrew Scriptures. In one story, the Jordan River stopped flowing and remain still while a group of priests carrying the ark crossed the river. Other stories describe how the Israelites took the ark with them into battle, where the powers of the ark helped the Israelites defeat the enemies. An amazing fact is that it took nearly eight tons of gold, silver, and bronze to build the entire tabernacle and all the vessels and utilities. Wow, right? Eight tons. So then, where is it? What happened to the Ark of the Covenant? And when is the last time anyone has ever seen it? Well, first of all, the last historical mention of the Ark of the Covenant in Scripture is in Second Chronicles chapter 35 where King uh, Josiah, who reigned in Judah around 640 to 609 B.C., asked the Levites to return the ark to the temple, where Solomon had originally housed it, after completing and dedicating the temple sometime in the 10th century B.C. We can read about Solomon in the dedicated temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. There is no mention as to why the Levites had removed the Ark of the Covenant in the first place, nor is there any indication as to whether or not the Levites complied with King Josiah's request to return the Ark. Prior to that, when the Ark was captured by the Philistines, outbreaks of tumors, disease, and mice afflicted them, forcing the Philistines to return the ark to the Israelites. Then after that came the Babylonian captivity, but there is no more record of the ark during the Babylonian captivity. The ark seemed to vanish when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem 
in 587 BC and took the children of Israel captive into Babel. At least there is no mention of the Ark of the Covenant anywhere in Daniel's writings. Scripture does suggest that the Babylonians took away the vessels of the Ark or ceremonial uh, utensils like golden cups, bowls, and stuff like that. But it does not mention taking away the Ark of the Covenant itself. Some modern day scholars teach that the Ark was in the Holy of Holies during Yahusha's time. But other scholars insist it was just a duplicate of sort. I suppose it could be possible that the last time the Ark was seen was in 70 AD. Whether the original or a duplicate just prior to the destruction of the second temple. But when the Roman soldiers invaded Jerusalem and killed tens of thousands of Jews and all but wiped out the existence of the entire set apart city, the ark was nowhere to be found. Although the Roman soldiers pillaged, plundered, and burnt down the city, they weren't seen carrying the ark away by Josephus nor was it seen being paraded through the streets of Rome. And the Ark of Titus, which is the victory gate leading to Rome, only depicts the menorah, showbread table, a couple trumpets of sorts, and signs pro proclaiming the victory. Since the Ark is not displayed as part of the booty or spoils carried away by the Roman soldiers, that's inscribed on the Ark of Titus, it becomes quite probable that they did not capture the Ark of the Covenant. Because the Ark was so famous and held in such high esteem around the world, it would have been a huge showpiece to be flaunted wildly in the streets of Rome by the Roman conquerors. So there is little chance that the Romans captured it and kept it quiet. Maybe, I mean, it is possible that the Jews knew the Romans were coming and only had time to remove and hide the most precious treasure to their hearts, and that being the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, if the Jews only had time to grab one thing to save, to save it from the approaching Roman armies, it would have been the Ark of the Covenant for sure. So since it is rather obvious that it was not found to be in the temple after ransacking and destroying Jerusalem by the Roman army, where is it then? <clears throat> Actually, since its strange disappearance from the Temple Mount and scriptural narrative around the 6th century BC, there have been a number of people claiming to have discovered its location or seen it in different locations around the globe. There have been many rumors of someone having possession of the Ark, which has created even more stories about how it is passed around from Jewish community to Jewish communities all over the planet in order to better hide its whereabouts from the world. Recently, there have been several possible places that have been suggested for its location. These include, but are not limited to, the caverns or tunnels underneath the Temple Mount itself in Jerusalem. Mount Nebo, this is where Moses was allowed to see the Promised Land from. South Africa, in the French caverns in Europe. Rome, Italy, in the basement of the Vatican, hidden in a treasure vault. This is where a Jewish rabbi had once claimed to have laid eyes on it and said it had dried up blood spots or stains all over it from the animal blood sacrifices or the red heifer. Buried on a mountain in Ireland, somewhere in Egypt, and the most popular place that is, it is believed to hold the Ark of the Covenant is in a cathedral or church in Ethiopia. In fact, on 
June 25, 2009, the Patriarch of the Orthodox Church of Ethiopia, Abuni uh, Paulos, said he would announce to the world the next day the unveiling of the Ark of the Covenant, which he said had been kept safe and secure in a church in Axum, Ethiopia. The following day, as the world waited, on June 26, 2009, the Patriarch announced that he would not unveil the Ark of the Covenant after all for security reasons, but instead he would simply attest to its current status as being safe, in good condition, and in the confines of the church. A very popular tradition that is spawned from the second book of Maccabees, chapter 2, is that Jeremiah took the Ark of the Covenant along with some other furniture from the tabernacle of Yahuwah and hid it in a cave on Mount Nebo and sealed the cave. Interestingly, in the book of Jeremiah, Yahuwah does say that there will be a time when no one will remember or talk about the Ark of the Covenant. Let's quickly read about that. It's in Jeremiah 3, 14 through 16. Return, O backsliding children, declares Yahuwah. For I shall rule over you, and shall take you, one from a city, and two from a clan, and shall bring you to Zion. And I shall give you shepherds according to my heart, and they shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall be when you have increased, and shall bear fruit in the land of those days, declares Yahuwah, that they no longer say, the Ark of the Covenant of Yahuwah. Neither will would it come to heart, nor would they remember it, nor would they visit it, nor would it be made again. Another very interesting point is that Stephen, prior to being stoned to death in Acts 7, points out to the Pharisees that Moses was instructed to make the ark exactly according to the pattern that he had seen. Is this mentioning of the Ark of the Covenant by Stephen suggesting that it did in fact exist within the Holy of Holies at that particular time? Maybe. Maybe it does. If not, then why would Stephen bring it up in the first place? If it wasn't in there during this entire time period, I mean Stephen's error was many centuries later after its strange disappearance during the Babylonian captivity. So wouldn't they have forgotten about it altogether by then? I mean, why have it on his mind and bother bringing it up at a time like that? Many people believe that the high priests were indeed going into the Holy of Holies once a year seemingly to perform the sprinkling of the mercy seat with animal blood. So it may have existed in that place at that particular time. Unless the high priest was faking it and lying to the people of Israel once a year, I mean, why else were they going into the inner room? And if we jump over to Revelations 11:19, we read, And the temple of Yahuwah was opened in the heaven, and the ark of the covenant was seen in his temple. And there came to be lightning and voices and thunders and an earthquake and great hail. So then, common sense is telling us that Yahuwah didn't take the earthly temple into heaven. And if there is a temple of Yahuwah in the heaven, as scripture just told us there is, then there is and was an Ark of the Covenant in the temple all along with all the other vessels and furniture. So it becomes common then, this heavenly temple with all its furnishings must be the pattern or copy that was seen and given to Moses to imitate on earth. Exactly. Furthermore, when Yahushua ascended into the heavens after his resurrection, 
he went into the temple of Yahuwah in heaven and sprinkled his atonement blood on the Ark of the Covenant, meaning the mercy seat, for the forgiveness of the chronic, uh, chronological sins of Israel. This is why he told Mary not to touch him, because he had not ascended to the Father as the first fruits, and had not sprinkled the mercy seat with his blood offering yet. This is stated fairly clearly in Hebrews 9.23, folks. Again, it says that it was necessary to clean the copies or imitations on earth with animal blood. And so the heavenly one should be cleansed with blood as well, but with a better slaughter offering than the earthly ones, meaning the precious blood of Yahusha. So does it really matter where the Ark of the Covenant is? If in fact it does still remain hidden and intact somewhere on the earth? Nah. No, nah, it really doesn't because the Old Covenant has been renewed and the Old Priesthood is annulled. The ten words that make up the Blood Covenant is now written on our hearts and mind by the finger of Yahusha's indwelling spirit. Another quick point I would like to bring up is that some folks are teaching that the earthly Ark of the Covenant was taken up into heaven, and this is what John saw when the Temple of Yahuwah was opened in the heaven, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen in Yahuwah's Temple by John. But in my opinion, this was the clean, pure, gold Ark of the Covenant that Moses saw and used as a pattern to copy after, exactly as commanded by Yahuwah, exactly. And I have a good reason for that. First of all, if Yahuwah has a heavenly temple built in heaven, as scripture suggests, then I am sure that he has his own incorruptible Ark of the Covenant in it. Moreover, Scripture plainly tells us that anything that is corruptible cannot inherit, inherit the reign of Yahuwah. In 1 Corinthians 15.50 we read, And this I say, brothers, that flesh and blood is unable to inherit the reign of Yahuwah. Neither does corruption inherit corruption. Anything that is not eternal is corruptible including wood and gold and stones. These are not eternal. In Romans 8, 19, 21 we read, For the intense longing of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of Yahuwah. For the creation was subjected to futility, not from choice, but because of him who subjected it in anticipation that the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage to corruption and to the esteemed freedom of the children of Yahuwah. Everyone should take the time to read Romans 8 in context. It's very powerful. Read Romans 8 in context. Besides, this world is being kept for fire, and also the vessels that are prepared for destruction beforehand will be burned up as well, which are the wrongdoers, of course. So think about that. Why would you who would take a corrupted vessel or anything else from this world that is set aside for destruction, meaning that which is made from flesh, stone, or wood, to heaven as a treasured possession, just to bring it back and destroy it by fire? Let's quickly read about this end time scenario in scriptures. Let's go to Isaiah 24. The erect shall mourn and wither, the world shall languish and wither, the haunty people of the erect shall languish, for the wretch has been defiled under its inhabitants, because they have transgressed the Torah, changed the law, broken the everlasting covenant, Therefore a curse shall consume the Eretz, and those who dwell in it be punished. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth shall be burned, and few men shall be left. Alright. Let's 
Let's go over to Peter. Second Peter 3, 5 through 15. For they choose to have this hidden from them that the Shemayim were of old and the rats standing out of water and in the water by the word of Elohim, to which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. And the present Shemayim and the Arets are treasured up by the same word, being kept for fire to a day of judgment and destruction of wicked men. Uh, so then it becomes common that Yahuwah isn't a collector of dust or perishable things or corruptible things. He is a collector of eternal things, the unperishable and incorruptible things, like spiritual beings, whom he promises to give immortal bodies and eternal life to, if they will only turn back to him and love him and obey his commands. And he is even willing to go up and beyond our understanding to deliver us from our death sentence. The renewed covenant and the new priesthood as described in the scriptures is clear, folks. Yahushua himself has become the blood offering, the altar and the brass furnace, the water cleansing bronze bowl, the gold menorah, the show table of bread, and the table of incense. Spiritually speaking, our flesh is the veil. Our beings, our souls are his mercy seat. We are the Ark of the Covenant, and the ten words are inscribed on our inward parts. And he now tabernacles or indwells in his cleaned up loving temples, which is us. We have cleansed and cleaned up the temple with the water and the blood. In 2 Corinthians 3, we read, but to this day when Moses or Torah is being read, a veil lies over their heart. And when one turns to the master, the veil is taken away. Now Yahuwah is the Ruach. And where the Ruach of Yahuwah is, there is emancipation. Spiritually, our fleshly mind or body is the veil. And when Yahushua's spirit passes through the veil, it is torn away and he indwells us and he takes his seat in the holy of holies inside of us which is our being or spiritual man in other words he now sits in our inward being and meets with us day by day from the mercy seat he speaks to us inside the holy of holies which is our spirit or inner man matter of fact if we really think hard about it the copies or patterns that were given to Moses are all representations of us. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah Elohim, Yahuwah is one. Will you worship the one true living Elohim in spirit and truth and become his dwelling place? Will you become part of the living, breathing stones that build up the house of Yahuwah? Are you willing to house the Ark of the Covenant behind your veil in your most inner chamber? Will you invite Yahushua to sit on the mercy seat of your inner man or spirit being? Amazingly, in Revelations 21.3, we read that the Sukkah tent or booth of Yahuwah is with men, which is Yahushua. And he shall dwell with them and they shall be his people and Yahuwah himself shall be with them and be their Yahuwah. And in Revelations 21, 22, we are told that there is no temple in the new city. For Yahuwah al Shaddai is its temple and the Lamb. And in Revelations 21, 9, 10, we are told that the bride or the Lamb's wife is a great city called the set apart Jerusalem, descending out from the heaven from Yahuwah. In Israel, the name of this great city is known as Yahuwah Shammah, meaning city of his people. So then, 
after the new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem is created, Yahuwah will, will be our temple and we will go in and out of him. But this isn't so hard to understand. If we really think about it, isn't that what we are doing now? Scripture does say that he is in us and we are in him. It does say that. If you can accept it, he is our every breath we take. Will you come and eat the manna from heaven and drink from the living waters? The spirit and the bride say, come. Please come. Yahusha is Yahuwah incarnated, and there is no other Savior besides Him. Yahuwah is our Creator, Lawgiver, Judge, Savior, Husband, Elohim, and High Priest forever. He is the great All in All, and He will be back soon to redeem His property that He bought and paid for with His own blood, which is His virgin bride without spot or wrinkle. He loves her with an everlasting love, and she will be his beloved forever. Thank you for watching, and remember to stay in love with Yahusha. So long, Nazarene. Bonus feature time. Yahushua answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is begotten of water and the Ruach, he is unable to enter into the reign of Yahuwah. That which has been begotten of the flesh is flesh, and that which has been begotten of the spirit is spirit. If you do not believe when I spoke to you about earthly matters, how are you going to believe when I speak to you about the heavenly matters? And no one has gone up into the heaven except he who came down from the heaven, the son of Adam. Spiritually speaking, the walls of the tabernacle are the strongholds deceiving the mind of the flesh. And outside the walls is the wide road or the world. Meaning the wall represents the barrier that separates Yahuwah from earthly man, which is sin. This can also be understood as a dimensional border that separates us from Elohim, with no access for the flesh to enter. Not all is lost. There is one gate on the eastern side which is well lit. It is the only gate that can lead us into Yahuwah's presence. This gate, of course, is Yahusha. He is the narrow gate. Once we find the narrow gate and walk through the gate, we find the salvation plan of Yahuwah, which begins to train us in the way of obedience. The furnace of offerings is made of brass and wood. This represents our repentance or change of heart and mind. This is where the perfect blood atonement sacrifice of the Lamb covers our sins or blots out the list of crimes against us. This is a vital step that is necessary before we can continue on seeking the face of Yahuwah. Next is the water basin made of bronze. This represents our water immersion or cleaning of the flesh by washing away the sins of an unclean lifestyle or putting off the sinful flesh. This does not mean or represent washing off the dirt from our hands or body. That is thinking with the mind of the flesh. Remember, this is a spiritual matter we are discussing. Then we pass through the first veil which represents the removal of the flesh or leaving the mind of the flesh and entering the mind of the spirit. This also represents our receiving of the Ruach, 
meaning we have received Yahushua's indwelling spirit, and at this point we are now standing on holy ground or in the spiritual world seeking Yahuwah's face, like Moses did when he was on top of Mount Sinai. In the spiritual world we find compelling truth and pure love residing here on the other side of this veil. The, the gold menorah represents the high priest that we now have as a mediator forever, who is lighting the path back to Yahuwah. He is the light of the world and lights the path for our feet, which is why he washed the feet of the disciples. The table of showbread and the showbread represents the sacrificial offering of praying with raised hands, while remembering to give Yahuwah thanksgiving for his provisions. In other words, it should re remind us that we ourselves and all we have belong to Yahuwah. The table of incense represents our perfect prayers of praise and our pure worship to Yahuwah. At this point in our spiritual walk, we have become the sweet-smelling fragrance of Mashiach to Yahuwah and to those who are being delivered. We have now put off all fleshly thoughts and are permitted to enter the second veil, which represents the clean mind of the spirit, which is Yahusha's mind. And we have now entered into Yahuwah's spiritual realm or the presence of our Creator. At this point, we are fully in the spiritual realm of Yahuwah and standing in the face of Yahuwah with a pure heart or we wouldn't be here to begin with. Spiritually speaking, we are now the Ark of the Covenant and our inner man, or spirit man, is the mercy seat where Yahuwah meets us every day. If you call to him, he will answer you and show you great and inaccessible things which you have not known. The lid of the covenant reminds us that Yahuwah is always above us. He covers or protects us with his power. The lid reminds us that he is Elohim and the head of the body. The cherubs on the lid on the ark reminds us that he commands his messengers concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. In other words, without Yahuwah's protection, we are totally exposed to all powers, rulers of darkness, and principalities and can do nothing on our own. The contents inside the ark represents who we were and who we have become. At first we were like the rod of Aaron, which was just a dry stick prepared for the fire, a dead branch without root. But after entering the covenant, we who had no hope and were once dead are now alive, reborn from above into a new creature, a spiritual type being. Aaron's dead rod leafed, budded, and produced fruit. In other words, the rod that was once dead became renewed and produced almonds. These are the first fruits in Israel to produce, or first trees in Israel to produce fruits each year. Our lives follow this same pattern until we have advanced in our spiritual growth enough to bear the good fruits of the Spirit. In other words, we have become a first fruits of sorts. The gold vessel represents us as the new a creation or creature refined as clean gold by Yahuwah. We have become clean wise virgins without spot or blemish containing the manna of heaven which is the word of truth that leads to life or more plainly spoken the manna from heaven is Yahusha's spirit in us. The blood covenant with Yahuwah's ten words written with the finger of Yahuwah on stone tablets kept inside the ark represents the renewed covenant which is Torah written on our hearts. This begins to make sense when you realize that we are the ark of the covenant and are carrying the written commands around inside of us. So basically our heart has become circumcised and the old wine skin has been removed and the old wine has been poured out. Yahusha has given us a new heart, not of stone, but of flesh. The ten words or ten commands have now been inscribed on our hearts of flesh by the finger of Yahushua's indwelling spirit, and he has filled our new wineskin with the new wine. So spiritually speaking, it has become very clear we are the real Ark of the Covenant, 
designed by Yahuwah long ago. And Yahuwah sits on the mercy seat, which is our spirit, and meets with us there. In other words, we are the living stones that make up the temple or house of Yahuwah. This is our purpose, to be one with Yahuwah and to rule with him forever. Yahuwah desires that his elect be his temple or permanent dwelling place, not a temporal tent of flesh or a house made by hands. Look at it this way. Just like the seven festivals are the shadow of things to come for the body of Mashiach, the tabernacle and all its contents, including the Ark of the Covenant, are the shadow of things to come for the reign of Yahuwah. Let's quickly read an important passage that pertains to the mind of the Spirit and Scriptures. We find it in 1 Corinthians 2, 9-16. Eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man what Yahuwah has prepared for those who love him. But Yahuwah has revealed them to us through his Ruach. For the Ruach searches all things, even the depths of Yahuwah. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Ruach of the man that is in him? So also the thoughts of Yahuwah no one has known except the Ru Ruach of Yahuwah. And we have received not the Ruach of the world, but the Ruach that is from Yahuwah in order to know what Yahuwah has favorably given us, which we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Ruach HaKadosh teaches, comparing Ruach-like things with Ruach-like things. But the worldly man does not receive the things of the Ruach of Yahuwah, for they are foolishness to him, and he is unable to know them, because they are abstractly discerned. But he who is Ruach-like discerns indeed all things, but he himself is discerned by no one. For who has known the mind of Yahuwah? Who shall instruct him? But we have the mind of Mashiach. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, take from the waters of life without pain. So long, beloved of Yahuwah. Yeah.